I must confess a little bit of ambivalence here. Many, many people have spoken, and many wonderful ideas have been expressed. And I wonder what will be the utility of yet another talk. I'm sure you're all saturated with speeches. As an outsider, in a way, I'm an outsider to, to India, unlike many of you who were born there and grew up there. I'm part of the true diaspora community of Indians who migrated or forced to leave India 167 years ago to work on sugar plantations in Guyana in South America. That is also part of a larger community that exists in Fiji, in Mauritius, in Trinidad, in Suriname, in South Africa, and one or two other parts of the world. So I suppose listening to me provides a kind of a different insight into some of the problems that you've been talking about here today. We do not identify so closely with some of the political problems we have heard mentioned here. And truly speaking, from a distance, it baffles us. It baffles many of us in the diaspora. It baffles many of us in Guyana, in South America, in Trinidad, in Suriname. But here you have a land of nearly one billion people who are complaining every day about cross-border terrorism. You have a land of one billion people and you hear about villagers being snatched across the borders in Bangladesh. You have a land of one billion people and we hear of terrorists undermining your most important sanctuaries. And I wanted to know to what extent we can feel with you. Why is it you have to come to America? Why is it you have to send emails across the world about terror in India? And you have a land of one billion people and you keep complaining day after day, night after night. How can we identify in what way can India continue to be a beacon of pride to us across the world when all we hear about India is disgrace and shame? Sometimes we grieve. We grieve tremendously because we in the West, we in the diaspora, look upon every Indian in some way or the other as some true light. Whenever an Indian comes across our path, we treat that person as a special human being. He is not just an ordinary human being. Maybe that's our failure. But it is a sad thing to hear of Indians complaining all the time about problems in India. And you're a land of one billion people. Do we need the help of America? Do we need the help of a few Indians scattered across the world to solve India's problems? when we are in such overwhelming majority in that land, something is radically wrong. Something is fundamentally wrong that you have a billion people and you have to look outside for help. Something is wrong. I had something prepared to speak on today, but I guess I may have to shift a little because some of our other persons and friends have in their own presentations made mention to some of the things I had thought about. But I guess one thought I would like to leave, and maybe it is because we are not so much part of the Indian, the experience of the Indian subcontinent that we may dare to suggest a thought for you to ponder on. And I think, I think it has to do with perhaps one of the most debilitating, crushing ideas that has come out of India. That we have found it to be that the idea taught by many gurus who come here, the idea promulgated by 
no less a person than Swami Vivekananda and his Guru Sri Ramakrishna. The idea taught again and again by Mahatma Gandhi and his followers, the idea that all religions are one. This to me is the most worrying, the most destructive concept that has ever come out of India and is affecting us all in the most deleterious fashion, in the most destructive way because we are not prepared to deal with the enemies who have long been cultured, who have long been prepared of how to deal with Hindus and Hinduism. So I would like to take a minute or two to express to you my feeling why I think it is not only silly but a dangerous fallacy to propagate the idea that all religions are one. And I know I may offend some people because many of us are followers of gurus who come. Can you imagine a Hindu sannyasi standing at the United Nations invoking Allah, invoking Jesus Christ? What is he saying to us Hindus who are being, who are under severe attack every day from the same forces of Allah and the same forces of Christ? So let me put it this way. Why I think that Hinduism and the other religions cannot be created and cannot be called the same? Thank you. I think that the religions of the world have been born in an environment of hostility. When Christianity came on the scene, it had to develop an antagonistic philosophy to deal with Judaism. When Islam came on the scene, it had to develop an antagonistic philosophy and an ideology to deal with both Christianity and Judaism. And so, in their very genesis, Christianity and Islam are hostile, antagonistic creeds. They are from the very day converting creeds and when they come to Hinduism, they come with their tools sharp and ready 